So, uh, hmm, I hate to break this to you, but while you weren't looking, Vanderdecken was able to tap you on the shoulder, and you are now a permanent target. Interestingly enough for you though, Vanderdecken has chosen to assault you with nothing but YouTube subscribe buttons, coming into contact with which will result in regular One Piece content from this channel being uploaded straight into your YouTube feed. So to be perfectly honest, if I were you, I would come to terms with your new subscribey destiny. Hello and welcome to the Grand Line Review, your source for everything One Piece. And today for the Devil Fruit Encyclopedia, we have one of the most strange and niche fruits to ever grace this series, being the always on point, Mato Mato no Mi. The Mato Mato no Mi is a Paramecia type fruit that makes its user capable of perfectly aiming at a chosen target with a chosen object from seemingly any location. Weird, but cool, I guess. And in the series, it was consumed by the bullhead shark Fishman Van de Decken the Ninth. And of course, it made its first appearance during the Fishman Island arc. This fruit takes its name directly from the Japanese word Mato, which means mark or target, which in this case is specifically a noun referring to a mark or target, which is very interesting because in English, mark and target can also act as verbs. For example, to target someone. But I only point that out because it's intended to immediately give us the impression that this fruit focuses far more on the acquisition of a target rather than the act of targeting, if that makes sense. And if it doesn't, um, too bad. Although it should become apparent soon enough, but in regards to the realm of English, both Viz and Funimation have decided to translate the Mata Mata no Mi very simply as the Mark Mark Fruit. Now hopping straight into things, this is another one of those surprisingly simple fruits, as it basically allows a user to acquire a target by touching a living being with one of their hands, and from that moment on, the user of the Mata Mata no Mi is able to target their mark with anything from anywhere at any time, or seemingly so anyway. So for example, if Zoro was the user of the Mata Mata no Mi and touched Sanji, then that would give him the ability to throw one of his swords whenever he saw fit, and the sword would then track down and collide with Sanji, provided that no other object or individual got in the way of it. And that is the simple gist of the fruit. So already the Mata Mata no Mi does present some similarities to another fruit that we've encountered, being the Mane Mane no Mi, currently possessed by Bon Clair, in that the powers of this fruit are only able to be activated by the hands of the user, as well as requiring the strict condition of touch. However, it should be noted that unlike the Mane Mane no Mi, the Mata Mata no Mi is able to memorize a target using either hand, which is a pretty big advantage. However, the flip side is that the Mata Mata no Mi user is not capable of retaining a permanent memory bank, which means at any given time, Time, a user may only have a very limited amount of targets, unlike the Mane Mane no Mi, which can seemingly hold an infinite amount of memory and all very easily and permanently accessible. And in regards to the target limit of the Mata Mata no Mi, well, that will actually vary from user to user in this crazy, crazy world because it's entirely dependent on the number of hands one has. So in the case of its user in the series Vanderdecken and most characters in One Piece and the world at large, he can hold a maximum of two targets because he has two hand things. However, someone like Hachan were to have consumed the fruit then he would be able to hold a grand total of six targets at any given time. However, even with such extended capabilities, there is still a potential detriment in that the user of the Mata Mata no Mi is not able to select their targets per se. So if their bare hand touches someone, that person becomes the target of that hand, whether the user likes it or not, thus erasing any memory of the previous mark, which is why Vanderdecken wears a glove on one of his hands to preserve the memory of a, a certain someone. However, with multiple marks recorded at once, the user is capable of differentiating which individual they wish to target simply by using the appropriate hand to signal the desired outcome. Although it may be much more versatile than that because Van de Decken has been shown using both of his hands and choosing a single target, which suggests that there is a degree of mental control and choice involved in regards to this power. Now, rather terrifyingly, we are currently unaware of any restrictions on the Mata Mata no Mi in regards to the distance that its effects may cover. Although I do bring that up as an important point because most Paramecia fruits do have some kind of limitation in this regard, even if they are often jokes by Oda. So for example, Luffy has an established distance that he can stretch. And Buggy has a defined spherical area where he can control separated limbs. And even Robin has a limit of how many limbs she can spawn. So I can only assume that the Mata Mata no Mi would be similar. However, it is at the very least a distance long enough to cover an area greater than that of Fishman Island. And this is further terrifying because the longer the distance between the target and the object being thrown, the greater the acceleration the object will gain on its travels, thus resulting in the potential for great damage to be caused to said target. And if there were no distance limit in regards to this, then there would be no we're safe in the world for a targeted individual to be. Interestingly enough though, it's not known if the user of the Mata Mata no Mi could target themselves. Although I don't see why it wouldn't be theoretically possible. Although at the same time, I also can't think of a fantastic use of that particular ability. If anything, it would just add an extra layer of complication because you would need to be super, super careful in regards to not wiping the memory of your targets by performing simple actions like scratching your nose on something and then accidentally targeting yourself and then throwing a knife and then, oh, that's, that's messy. But let's get into some Van de Decken specific use now. And 
I have to say that, well, he is certainly not the best user that the Mata Mata no Mi could have ever dreamed of. Primarily because Dekken almost exclusively engaged its abilities to pursue his obsession with one Princess Shirahoshi, whom he decided he would marry when Dekken first laid eyes upon her. And I'd like to note that Shirahoshi was, you know, six years old at the time, so that's a slightly creepy maneuver by Van der Dekken there. But he would proceed to acquire her mark memory and target her with all sorts of love letters, proposals, deadly axes, you know, all the standard dating gifts, which resulted in Shirahoshi being locked away for 10 years for her own safety. However, Van der Dekken does use his power fairly decently outside of this obsession, and he uses its incredibly bizarre effects to catch people off guard. And I know that the One Piece world is pretty damn crazy, but even then, nobody expects a heat-seeking knife to relentlessly track you down after being touched by a seemingly harmless pedophilic fishman. Speaking of, though, the fact that Van der Dekken is a fishman is very much at odds with consuming a devil fruit at all, and makes him absurdly vulnerable given that he lives on the sea floor because he has lost all ability to swim, and as such, he must remain inside a bubble at all times to continue the mere act of living. So just based on that alone, he is probably high up on the scale of the worst devil fruit users we've ever encountered. But to give him some credit, Van der Decken also used this incredibly weird devil fruit to craft a potentially apocalyptic event when he targeted Shirahoshi with the Noah and almost destroyed the entirety of Fishman Island. Which is also another nice benefit to lay out there in that the user of the Mata Mata no Mi does not necessarily need to be able to throw or even lift an object that they want to send towards their mark. Which means that in theory, Van der Decken could do this with almost any non-living object. And so just for an extreme example of that, I wonder how this route would play out if Van der Decken decided to target someone with say, the entirety of the Red Line, AKA the largest landmass and only continent of the One Piece world. And then if the entire Red Line were to just lift up and float towards its target, then that would be pretty damn apocalyptic. Now, as for a glorious awakening, this fruit holds a couple of options, none of which are the stock standard Paramecia shenaniganry. And I think that this fruit could certainly be bettered by allowing its user to have a permanent memory bank, just like the Mane Mane no Mi, which would mean that anybody who had been touched by them would need to live in perpetual fear. But another intriguing option would be to allow the user to make marks of non-living things, as well as target them or other individuals with living things, sort of do the old switcheroo. And this isn't quite as ridiculous as it sounds, because going back to the question of whether or not Van der Decken could make himself a target. If this kind of awakening were possible, then he could make, say, an island a target, and then he could launch himself towards it for super quick transportation, kind of like what Bartholomew Kuma can do, just significantly more crude and likely much more owie. Some other miscellaneous things to consider when becoming a marking human. One very important thing to note is that this is another Paramecia whose effects cease to be as soon as its user reaches a certain level of unconsciousness. And as a user, that is very important to keep in mind because this may result in a complete memory wipe of your targets and leave you with a blank slate upon waking up. And also something intriguing to note is that because this fruit is so focused on the use of hands, it may be just plain useless to some other people or creatures. Like for example, if a snake were to accidentally consume the fruit, then it would gain absolutely no benefit whatsoever and just be cursed with being unable to swim. Meanwhile, while figures out there like Shanks would see a very limited benefit from the Mata Mata no Mi due to the fact that he only has one hand to make use of. And it also actually brings up the question of what this fruit actually considers a hand. And here I'm thinking about situations like Frankie because his hands are completely cybernetic. So would that count as a hand under the criteria of the Mata Mata no Mi? And if so, does that mean that any artificial limbs are acceptable? Like another extreme example, could Kumidori consume the Mata Mata no Mi and gain infinite amount of targets because he can turn his long hair into a billion hands? We just have so so many questions. In the end though, this is a super strange fruit, and I think that it does have very limited use, much of which would be for highly vindictive purposes as shown by Van der Decken. I suppose an argument could be made that this fruit would be amazing for transporting heavy things, but I don't think that's a great idea. Because yes, you can cover a great distance, but in the end, whatever you're transporting is going to need to collide with someone or something. Thus either damaging the goods in question or the poor, poor target. And it's strange because for something so specific, it is a surprisingly crude fruit fruit and probably very difficult to implement well in most aspects of daily life. I mean, it does certainly have its uses, perhaps super mundane things like sending a handwritten letter without using a postal service. But yeah, I don't know, look, if it was me, I would be steering clear of this one. And with that, we are going to commit the Mata Mata no Mi to the Devil Fruit Encyclopedia. Next time on the Devil Fruit Encyclopedia, we are traversing back into the Zoan realm in order to discuss a bizarre situation about a turtle fruit being used by a lion with the Kamehame no Mi. 
If you enjoyed this video and the content this channel produced in general, then please do consider donating to the Grand Line Review Patreon because the support of all of you amazing people is what continues to make this channel possible. And if you'd like to see more videos like this but applied to other anime and manga series, then please do check out my second channel, New World View, for all of your wider needs. And if you'd like to join the fun at any time, then please do head over to my Discord server where a wide array of shenanigans takes place on a daily basis. And finally, please do comment with your thoughts on the Mato Mato no Mi. This has been the Grand Line Review, and I'll see you next time. What is your process of making a video? So coming up with the idea, making the video, and editing it. All right, so this whole video making process starts long, long in advance. Basically, I have a series of monthly calendars in my office space at home that account for roughly three months at a time. And they have the large majority of videos listed for that period. So basically every month I have some brainstorming time where I come up with a bunch of ideas for the next month for both of my channels and then I just dump all of those on a calendar. And not all of those videos get produced on the day that they were originally written for. Some get pushed back, some get pushed forward and others get dropped entirely. In fact, there's rarely a week where everything goes as planned and I always find myself reconfiguring stuff on a daily basis. But once all of those ideas are written up in title alone, I get to writing, and I try to write at least one script a day in order to keep up with the demand of two channels. And on the odd occasion, I'll go on writing sprees, putting together, I don't know, maybe like three scripts a day or something stupid like that. Well, those periods don't normally last very long, but I do it so that I can have at least a month's worth of written material ready to go in advance, just in case something pops up in life and I can't write for a week or two. And chapter reviews and stuff like that are not included, of course, they need to be done always at the last minute. And to give you an idea of how far in advance I prepared this, I've got it down here that I wrote this script on the 18th of January. And in regards to recording and editing, this gets done much closer to release, usually the day of or day before the actual posting of the video. And this is done because I used to edit videos way in advance, but it backfired on me a couple of times, especially with things like One Piece 101. When I make a video about a character a couple of weeks in advance, and then a new chapter comes out with more information about them, and I have to go back and rewrite, re-edit, and it's just a bit of a pain to do. So it's just more efficient to produce things on the day of or the day before release. But basically my standard day of working on these channels will consist of writing a script for a video coming out about a month from now, then recording and editing a video that needs to come out either that day or the next day, and then a whole ton of other stuff like graphic design for thumbnails, which are usually done by me at the last minute as well. And also stuff like making devil fruit images for the encyclopedia. And there's just an oddly surprising amount of work that isn't writing, recording or editing. But that's the basic gist of it. I hope to go into the process in much more detail, maybe even have a whole video on it at some stage, because I think it's pretty interesting and it might give others a good idea of how to manage getting started in YouTube. But for now, that's kind of it.